Well, um, welcome back, everyone. It's, uh, it's, great to, it's great to have you for this afternoon session. It's, uh, uh, so we can see Jean Tirol. Uh, fantastic to have you, Jean. Let, uh, it, it doesn't uh, need that much of an introduction. I mean, Jean is, uh, is a giant in the profession. Uh, we all grew up learning from his textbooks. And actually, at some stage, we also taught from his textbooks. I think it's also uh, not an understatement to say that uh, the foundations of many of the topics that we're discussing in this conference actually owe to uh, Jean's pioneering work. Uh, in a way, he actually invented the whole notion of competition on platforms. And not least, he, uh, he's a Nobel laureate uh, for, for many of these contributions. And one of the really endearing features of Jean is that he, uh, he never sits back and rests on his laurels. He's always thinking. He's always fresh. And actually, in preparation for uh, this presentation, uh, Jean spent several hours with uh, Leonardo and, uh, and other colleagues to really I, come up to speed. You and I don't uh, hear you. Come up to speed with, uh, with, uh, with what we've been working on. So Jean, can you, can you hear me? Well, maybe, maybe you can communicate with the email, first of all. So um, uh, he's been thinking very hard about digital payments and ecosystems. Uh, so, Jean, I hope you can hear me. Now I can hear you. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So I, I just gave you a very brief introduction. Um, so we have uh, half an hour for this session. Um, uh, but uh, perhaps you could uh, spend 25 minutes uh, and then leave uh, a few minutes at the end for questions. But over to you. Thank you again for doing this. Sure. Uh, thanks so much uh, for inviting me. And uh, I apologize for not being able to be with you. I also apologize for the technical issues that I'm encountering. I'm on my phone, actually, so it's a bit more complicated. So I'm going to talk about two topics. One is a digital ecosystem and a connected topic, which is digital payments. Uh, slide two. Um, first, let me share with you a few thoughts about competition policy um, and digital ecosystem. So, um, just this is a simplified view of uh, of those ecosystems with a platform in the middle. The platform can be a search engine, a marketplace, an app store, a social network, or something like that. And it's going to uh, connect consumers with business users. So business users might be app or merchant uh, app developers or merchants. They might be in-house or third party. And they might be competing among each other. And there's been a bunch of uh, legal aspects to that, uh, new laws, uh, both on consumer protection, trying to protect the consumer against manipulations and deceiving uh, information. And there are a bunch of uh, rules about that, like P2B, uh, DSA, and so on, and AI Act. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. that. The DMA, which is a Digital Market Act, uh, is more on the anti-competitive uh, aspect to it. Um, and it has two sides. One I'm not going to develop is contestability, which is basically the question of whether the next Google, the next Facebook, the next Amazon can replace incumbent if it's better somehow. So can entry occur in this uh, monopoly segment? And then a second set of issues, which I'm going to discuss, which probably is more important for payment system, but not the only thing, is the issue of uh, third party apps or merchants access. So there can be two issues. The first is that the, the platform actually give a better access to the in-out, in-house apps or merchants. That's self-preferencing. But even if it's a your platform and it's just serving some party apps or merchants, it might charge uh, access fees which are too high, yeah. merchant fees which are too high. Slide, please. So we have a very important piece of legislation in, in, in Europe, uh, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, so the Digital Market Act, DMA, has two uh, facets, as I mentioned, contestability and fairness. 
uh, contestability I'm not going to discuss except for one point. Basically, you try to reduce the network benefits so as to facilitate entry by new platforms. And the controversial one in this is the data silo. So basically, uh, the idea is that Google will no longer be able to um, will no longer be able to um, combine data from various services. Um, and that, of course, reduces efficiency because much of the value of the data comes from uh, from the ability to combine data. Now, I'm going to uh, focus on fairness. So do business users receive a fair share of their contribution to the ecosystem? And do they have equal access to the core services? Um, but why are we concerned about fair access? So why are we concerned about the denial of access or excessive access prices? After all, the Chicago School, I mean, it's, it's, it's a reinterpretation of a Chicago School argument. Chicago School has argued that, you know, the platform would not have incentive to do that because it will benefit from a rich ecosystem and it could monetize this rich ecosystem, basically having more competition and a broader diversity of products can monetize that to consumers. So that, that's the issue. Slide, please. So there are two reasons I want to mention, which are important, of course, for payment system. Uh, the first reason is that if you have multiple routes to reach a merchant, so that means the consumer doesn't single home, it's actually multi-homing, then basically through an institution which is called a most favored nation clause, uh, it's easier to understand as a price guarantee, best price guarantee, um, basically platform can tax their rivals. So take the following example, I'm going to use payment cards, but it could be anything else. Um, imagine that you're an American Express customer and you buy something at the merchant at the point of sale. And at this point of sale, you want to use your American Express card. Okay. Now the merchant has to pay a merchant fee or an excess charge is the same, which might be said 3%. Of course, for other platform, it might be different. It might be 15, 30%, it depends. But the merchant has to pay 3% and doesn't want to pay 3%, of course. Um, and furthermore, American Express is going to insist on the merchant uh, applying a most favored nation clause. So that means that the merchant cannot charge a higher price to American Express card payers, uh, pay payment uh, uh, customers, than if the consumer were buying with a cash or with a check or another payment card. Uh, in the case of um, of payments, uh, the the MFN is called a no surcharge rule. Um, that's important because once you have this, you have the possibility of taxing your rivals. So, if you increase this uh, three percent to four percent, who is going to pay for it? And the answer is that it's going to be all consumers, not only the American Express customers, but also those who pay by cash or visa or check simply because the merchant cannot raise a price on just American Express customer, it has to raise a price on all consumer from the most favored nation clause. And therefore, you know, some of the increase in the access charge will be paid actually by non-users of the American Express platform. Um, that's one of the rare cases where actually you can tax your, your, your rivals. Um, and you know, so for example, if American Express has 10% market share, that means that 90% of the uh, ex excess charge increases is, is paid by non-American Express customers. So a number of uh, authorities and also governments have decided to actually to try to get a pass through only to platform customers. And for that, they have prohibited MFNs. That has been very popular in Europe. But there are two issues, uh, slide please, new slide please. There are two issues with the prohibition of MFNs. Um, there's one technical thing is that actually you have efficiency defenses. I'm not going to talk about that, but there's a, a simpler reason, which is that those MFNs are not um, effective. Why? Simply because um, you, the merchant may apply voluntarily a best price guarantee. 
by the fear of being downlisted. Actually, there's evidence on that. So Amazon actually was not forced, unlike Booking and others, was not forced to give up the MFN. It chose actually to to give up the MFN, but it knew pretty well that actually there will still be an MFN in place, an implicit one. And actually, there is some evidence that uh, if a merchant actually applies a lower price on on Walmart or on eBay, actually it's going to be downlisted by Amazon and therefore it's going to lose customers. Um, the other reason, technical reason for why you can avoid the MFN. So that suggests that instead of prohibiting uh, the MFNs, um, you might want to regulate the terms and condition of access. So roughly this access charge A. Uh, slide please. So the problem is that we don't have that much information about what this access charge A should be. So Jean-Charles Roche and I, a long time ago, proposed uh, a benchmark in the specific case of uh, payment cards. And the principle is very simple. So uh, is, it, is that the same picture a little bit simplified? Um, the idea is there is that the merchant receives a merchant convenience benefit from a card payment over, say, a cash payment or a check payment. Uh, there's fraud protection, there's simpler accounting, there's a speed at the point of sale, there is no robbery if you use card as opposed to cash. Uh, so it's, it's a good thing for the merchant actually to have cards, but you want to put a ceiling, a cap on the access charge, a merchant fee, which is paid by the merchant, say to American Express or Visa. And the idea is that you put that ceiling at the merchant convenience benefit. Um, and it's a simple principle because in the end, it's a consumer who chooses uh, which um, which payment form to, to, to use, uh, whether it's going to use American Express or cash or a check. And if you have A equals B, uh, if the access charge is equal to merchant convenience benefit, that means there is no externality on the merchant. And if you get rid of the externality, it's like a Pigouvian uh, ID. And there are a couple of other papers who actually do that. Um, it's used in the EU, I understand it's going to be used in Brazil as well. Um, but that's one case in which we basically uh, have a view on what this should be. I mean, it could still be improved both on the theoretical front but also on the on vehicle front, but at least we have some guidance about what to do. Slide, please. Now, second concern, even if you, if there is no alternative route, so you cannot pass through some of the excess charge to, to your rivals, um, to an MFN, uh, you still might be a monopoly because of single roaming. If the consumer single home, so they connect and use a single platform, and then it's going to, to be the case that this platform is a monopoly, has a monopoly for access to the consumer. So, you know, if, if you are always on Amazon or always on, uh, on Google search, then basically those platforms have, have a monopoly on you. And they can dictate their conditions, and in particular, the access charge of fee A, the rival apps or merchants, uh, because if they don't pay that, they won't have access to the consumers of the platform. Um, the general uh, insight of the series is that the platform is going to charge an access charge, which is way too large, because it's going to try to squeeze the rival's profit. So the rival, the interesting case is where the rival is better than whatever is offered in-house, or maybe nothing is offered actually, actually in-house. And the platform will try to squeeze the profit of the rival app and transfer the, those profits to the platform. And that raises issues. And by the way, this issue is not resolved through platform competition. Platform competition does nothing to solve this issue, actually, simply because even if the platform has only 10% of the consumer, it's still a monopolist on the consumer. So you get exactly the same result if you have platform competition, as if you have no platform competition. The fact is that if you have single homing consumer, the platform is a competitive bottleneck. Now, the DMA in Europe realizes that, 
and says we should regulate access charge so that they are fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. Friend. Um, that is something which is fine, but uh, in a, I object to it. Also, because I, it's way too too vague. I mean, I've been working on essential patents where you have a friend requirement as well, and this just doesn't work simply because what is fair, what is reasonable, is very hard to figure out. We must also realize that uh, having too low an excess charge is not good either. So it should not be too high, but it should not be too low either because. If it's slow, that means the platform cannot make money out of giving us access. So it has a very high temptation to foreclose or engage in self-referencing. And that's an issue. Unless you spend your life actually checking that every possible app or merchant has an equal access to the platform, um, that's not a good idea to have an access charge, which is zero, for example. Next slide, please. Um, so, what are the considerations for a proper setting of excess charges? And we may come back to the Chicago school question. Why would a platform benefit from degrading its ecosystem through foreclosure? Or, for that matter, through high access charges? And there are two answers. The first answer is that the platform cannot make money by selling in-house apps if A is less than B. So A is access charge and B is a benefit. Now it's slightly different concept as relative to before. B is the benefit of having the consumer use the in-house app. So think about the benefits that come from the in-house app, like data collection, like advertising, like merchant fees. I mean, even apps can have merchant fees for like PayPal, for example. Um, and those benefits at value say B, and if A is less than B, that means that uh, the in-house app, assume it's constrained by the zero lower bound, which means that it cannot charge negative prices, um, then if A is equal to B, then the platform is better off for closing um, the rival app. The second issue with the Chicago School argument, which I, I mentioned, in, indirectly before, you remember the, the Chicago School argument is that if you have a great ecosystem with low prices and a lot of diversity, you can monetize on the consumer side. But that, that ignores the fact that actually uh, you, uh, you cannot do that if, if the platform itself is at zero or bound. So when you use Google or Facebook or Amazon, you don't pay anything, so you are the zero or bound. That's another zero lower bound, which is a core zero lower bound. You don't charge your consumers. And there you cannot, at the margin, you cannot, you, you would like actually to charge negative prices because those consumers have a high value to you. But you can because otherwise you will have bots and the like. Um, so in the end, you charge a zero price and you cannot monetize at the margin uh, you know, your increase. Um, uh, your increase is uh, in quality of the ecosystem. Okay, so um, I'm I'm doing some work with with a student of mine, Michele Bisceglia, where we find that the optimal rule is A equals B. <laughs> um, those rules are as simple as A equals B. Um, that actually um, compensates the, the platform for the loss of consumer, so there's no foreclosure, and that provides a fair reward. I'm, I'm going very fast here for what um, the app or the merchant contribute to the ecosystem. So actually we get we can get some guidance on what will be good actually in terms of access charge. Next slide, please. So let me come to the second topic, um, which is currency war. I will be a little bit fast at the beginning because those are things you are better experts than I am on this, but there's a connection with the first topic. So, as you know, there is currently uh, some uh, digital currency war with public cryptocurrencies, all the, the pride currencies. Actually, that's game now. Um, but, you know, big tech currencies, which are going to surface. And finally, the nation state digital money. 
and the CBDCs. Okay. Um, nothing new. Um, what for? Well, uh, there will be competition for creating stores of value of savings, but the real competition now is about transaction. So medium of exchange and unit of account. Okay. Next slide, please. So um, I will argue that cryptocurrency face a big business model challenge and also that our governments also face a big challenge with cryptocurrency. So let me start with the former. Um, the crypto assets so far has been as have served as a store of value, um, as speculative access, not for transactions so much. And there are good reasons for that because they are still expensive, they are slow. They lack a, a two-sided business model. Uh, you know, if you want to serve that just in the same way that the American Express or Visa have to attract both cardholders and merchants, you have to attract the buyers and sellers. So if you don't have the business model in mind, it's not going to work. Um, then there is a price issue of price stability. So it's well known that those cryptocurrencies are highly volatile, and that's why um, they're trying to actually introduce stable coins. I mean, for a number of years, it has been the case. Um, let me let me just restate the obvious. The first is that um, the collateral for those uh, stable coins has to be segregated and prudentially supervised. Um, if it's good collateral, it's going to be safe, low yield, and therefore there is a very high temptation to underhold. So you can have treasury bonds or, or the like, or cash or reserve at the central bank, um, but basically. It's a lot, of course, but basically um, you need to have low yield assets. So there is a very strong temptation. Now, on top of that, there is the issue of who is responsible for those crypto assets. If there is any trouble, who is going to supervise a reserve fund? Because a stable coin will be global and who is acts as the last lender of last resort in case of a run. Okay, so that raises several issues, but even if you solve those issues, even if you do it properly, you, raise, you have the issue that, uh, as a recent report by the BIS itself notes, it's just not going to bring anything to, to, on the table because it's going to be just an appendage of to the monetary system. It's just going to piggyback and, and do what the monetary system will do. Next slide, please. Um, there, are, there are four uh, public policy. Uh, ne next slide. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. It is there. I'm sorry. There are four public policy concerns about applied digital currencies. Uh, the first is well known non palatable aims, uh, fraud, uh, tax evasion, terrorism, blah, blah, blah. Second is well known as well the loss of senior age. It's wasted through servers, environmental damage, uh, and so on. Or it's privatized, uh, issuing uh, new coins, um, new tokens. There are challenges for financial stability. If, if they were to succeed, uh, how do you do contra cyclical monetary policy? And if in the end, the retail investor, the SMEs and other financial intermediaries are hurt because they hold a lot of uh, cryptocurrency, then there will be a very strong pressure on politicians uh, to have a bailout. And there are good reasons why the payment system is a uh, highly regulated institution all over the world. Okay, so this being said, you know, you may have noticed I'm not a big fan of uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, this being said, they serve a purpose. They serve at least two purposes, or they want to serve two purposes. One is, of course, to protect consumers against rogue rogue states. So if you are in a in a dictatorship, maybe after all, having access to cryptocurrencies can be can be useful. But also, there is a lot of discontent with the inefficiencies of private and public sectors. The slow and, and costly transfer of ownership, the implementation of smart contracts, which is not easy, and so on. So, in a sense, you know, those are warning signals. Get your act together. And that's how I see um, their role, actually, just to say, you know, maybe we should get our act together. Next slide, please. 
So that brings me to the central bank uh, digital currency. And, um, you know, countries have been pretty slow at creating an integrated payment system. Despite competitive advantage, the state can decide what currency taxes must be paid in. It can decide what is a legal tender. It can force banks and fintech to join plat the, the public platform. So it has lots of advantages. But of course, there are questions that it doesn't solve. So what should be the quantity of retail CBDCs? I'm not going to talk about all CBDCs. And should retail CBDCs compete with bank deposits? Should they be directly at the central bank? And so on and so forth. Um, my overall tone here will be, uh, don't reinvent the wheel, okay? So the way I see retail CBDCs is just a more efficient technology which is going to allow, allow more complex contracts, it's going to reduce transaction costs, provide immediate transfers and the like. So it's going to be more efficient, but in the end, you must keep the same, basically the same principle. New slide, please. So just a remark on the scope of CBDCs. Not all retail deposits are meant to be safe. By this, I mean protected from billionability. Um, in the end, the riskless nature of retail deposits is pride by the state, which is going to cover for tail risk, but deposit in normal times will be covered by loans. Okay, so that's important to realize. The second point is that not every retail deposit is meant to be short-term demandable. Actually, the banks perform a transformation function that take deposits, demand deposits, and lend long, to, just to simplify. But even so, not all deposits should be actually uh, demand deposits. Now, in theory, there are cases in which having all deposits being demandable will work because you have overlapping duration of depositors, but you'd better not have bank or economy-wide shocks for this to work. New slide, please. Um, now, if you had a very wide access to CBDCs, that will substantially enlarge the size of safe dependable deposits. It's safe because it's a claim on the central bank and it will be perfectly demandable. Is that desirable? Well, I'm not sure. Um, and also, if you know, CBDCs were not deposited in commercial banks, then the government would have to make the loans. And I don't trust the government to make the loans. They don't have the expertise. They may engage in favoritism. They may engage in some budget constraint to be too lenient with insolvent borrowers. So that's not a good solution. Slide, please. Um, I'm almost there. So here is a possible contour for retail CBDCs. Um, in terms of the scope, they could correspond to today's insured demandable deposits. So in a sense, there will be no change. You could have at least 100,000 uh, euros of uh, insured uh, CBDCs. Um, and, but the diff you will have difference is that you could have a very fast payment system. The location will correspond to a two tier account based system where the CBDC will be managed by the banks and you avoid uh, disintermediation. The basic service will be free. So basically, People, it will be a little bit like uh, electronic payments under SEPI within Europe, or, uh, UPI in India, I don't know. I mean, some kind of basic free payment service. And the bank will add proprietary upper layers, smart, smart contract, credit, uh, interest payment, uh, or withdrawal, or something like that. And could also combine data for efficiency. Okay. Um, the uh, there will be a quick pro quo, so the banks will get this privilege, but of course they will have to pay the deposit insurance fee because after all, that will be an insured deposit, like current insured deposit, so you have to pay the deposit insurance fee, and you could possibly pay also an access fee, which will correspond to the benefits from data collection and the profits on the other layers, okay? Now, there's still the issue of privacy, and of course, we, we need to pre protect consumers from rogue states. So the central bank um, will, will know only uh, the aggregate position of the bank um, and the private privacy with 
and the protection vis-a-vis -vis the government will be subject to exactly the same rule as now. So, for example, the use of a court to allow inspection. Next slide, please. It will be the last slide. Um, there's still many challenges in this world. So, in a sense, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm just saying let's do things better. Um, but the same principles. Um, the countries could cooperate, and that would be very important in my view, to create a cheap cross-border payment option. As you know, it's very expensive, including in a developed countries, actually, to transfer money. Uh, so, you know, all those fixed fees, percentage fee, some kind of uh, foreign exchange rate, which is quoted to you. Um, we need to have some form of international legal tender. So, for example, you could make any transfer you want from euro to dollars, and then you'll be paying um, the ask price or, or, or the bid price, depending on which direction you go. Um, and, you know, on, on a very liquid market, that would be great. Um, I would I would certainly go for that. I recognize that my proposal to let the bank use the data might actually strengthen even more dominance of big tech, which I don't like. Just read my paper, the one I cited, I cited on the first slide. Um, if you want more details on uh, on on antitrust and big tech, um, and it, those big tech have more data, they have AI superiority, analysis superiority. And they can, on top of that, enforce powerfully the loan repayment because they can, of course, exclude the merchants uh, from the e-commerce platform if they don't reimburse their loan. So they will be even stronger, and that's something that worries me. I just put it on the table. Uh, in any case, the contestability and fairness requirement are even more essential in this world. And finally, another question which I don't have the answer to is, what about uh, what we have in our portfolios like treasuries, but they are not short-term claims. They are, you know, might be one year, five years. They are insured because they have claims on the state, but they are not demandable. So, but they could be transformed into liquidities pretty easily by the same process as I sketched for cross-border payments. Um, so they would be highly liquid, highly liquid at the individual level, but not at the aggregate level. Is that desirable or not? So let me conclude with this question and, and we really thank you so much both for the invitation and for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Jean, for that uh, uh, very broad and uh, thought-provoking overview. I, I suppose we could call it the, the platform economics of the monetary system. Uh, and uh, it, it fits very nicely with the, with the whole theme uh, of this conference. So um, perhaps, uh, perhaps one or two very brief questions. Um, could we have the microphone at the front, please, for, for Benoit Carré? Just here. So, Jean, I don't know whether you can see the room, but uh, we have uh, Benoit here. I with can us. see the room. I could not see who is speaking. That's yes, it's sure. Benoit. <laughs> shall I, shall okay. I stand? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Jean. Thank you for this uh, Hi, very, very insightful uh, presentation, which I guess we are going to digest the whole afternoon. Um, I, I, I wanted to come back to what's at the center of the, of the first part of your presentation, which is A equal B. Um, mm -hmm. That is this, this notion that the, uh, the access fee to a platform should be equal to the uh, opportunity cost of not being a member of the platform, to, to, put, it, to put it simply. Uh, and I can see how it makes a lot of sense, but I have two questions. Um, first question is, what about the consumer standing on the other side of the platform? So is there any, and, and that's also about who's going to benefit from A, right? Uh, does, should A accrue to the platform, or should, that be, should, should there be some uh, sharing uh, uh, of A between the platform and the consumer? That's uh, my first question. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is more about the uh, empirics of it, uh, or the practicality of it. <clears throat> one, of the big, uh, one of the defining discussions in, uh, in antitrust today, and you, mentioned, you, you actually mentioned it initially, is whether enforcement should be exposed or ex-ante, right? It's usually it's ex-ante, so you find that A is higher than B, and you spend like five years uh, 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 crunching numbers about A and B, and then uh, six years later, you find the platform, and uh, 
Meanwhile, uh, all the competitors are dead, but that's, uh, that's how we do it usually. Um, and, uh, and so we are now moving in Europe towards ex-ante regulation under the DMA, which you mentioned. But what's, what's your view as a, also from a, as a, as a theoretician on, you know, what's the best way to extract information on A and B? And do you have a view on whether we should go for the ex-ante uh, way or the, or the ex-post way? Okay, those are two excellent questions. Um, the platform will always, uh, on your first question, the platform will always receive the access fee or the merchant fee. Um, the question then is that, of course, it's going to make the platform more eager to acquire consumers because the consumers will be highly profitable for the platform because the platform makes money on the other side. So, so in a sense, the consumers are going to gain from that. Now, this is not quite the same if you have what we call the zero law bound. I'm sorry for the macroeconomists. The microeconomists also use zero law bound now. Um, so if the, if the consumer were not paying in the first place, um, but you know, still the platform will, will, will use other tricks to provide new services in order to attract the consumers because those consumers make money. I mean, the problem when A is equal to zero is that the platform doesn't make money um, on the upside. So it has to make the money on the consumer side. But if it makes some money on the upside, then that's different. It's going to be trying to attract the consumers, and the consumers uh, will um, will gain from that. So, by the way, the paper with Michele is not quite ready yet, but it's going to be ready soon. So, if, if you are interested, you can contact me, and I, I could in, a, in the next few weeks actually send you a copy. But um, so that that is thing is that the two side market there is a, a CISO principle in a sense. So. You know, if if if, uh, if the platform makes money on apps and merchant, then it's 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 going to uh, to actually give better condition to consumers. Um, on the ex ante versus ex post um, thing, it's a very good question. So, um, yes, you are, you are right. So the DMA is going toward an ex ante regulation, which I think is important because, as you said. If you intervene ex post after six years, everybody is dead anyway. Um, so you have to intervene ex ante. So now the the regulator will have more power. The antitrust authority will have more power actually to intervene and say your access charge is not right. But still, as we know actually from the tourist test rule, it's not that easy to compute B, right? Uh, it's definitely complicated. It's better than having no benchmark, but it, you know it's not that easy. Um, so in the, in the paper with Michele, we try other things, which is not, which is not uh, perfect. Uh, we have something very provocative, so let me take it, please, with a grain of salt. What's sure is that you cannot have a platform. You won't get a truthful elicitation from the platform on what B is, but um, you can get truthful elicitation from uh, from the app. So the app can actually offer an access charge. And we have this section in which we, we actually say the app can ask for an access charge, uh, propose an access charge, and then the platform is allowed to deny access, to foreclose it. Now, there are reasons to have doubts about this, but and we have more on that. But what we're doing is we're groping toward a system under which instead of the regulator measuring B, you basically elicit uh, the B from the actors themselves. And it's not easy, but of course it's 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 not information intensive the way it is when you have regulation of of B. I don't know if I'm being very clear, but uh, this is this is really the frontier of research. You know, we we need to actually improve that still, and this is this is moving. I mean, there are more and more papers uh, trying to to improve mainly the tourist test rule, um, which is a different issue, response to a different issue. Um, well, that's that's really uh, the state of the art. I cannot tell you much more. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. This has uh, uh, been a great start to the afternoon session. Uh, thank you again for joining us uh, remotely. We we really all um, learned a lot from your from your presentation. So, um, Juan Carlos, why don't I come back to you? <laughs> And we're going to move to the next session.